1939, two months after Britain declared war on Germany, the eldest daughter of India's Viceroy was getting married. Many felt the celebration, in public at least, should be restrained. Lord Linlithgow, the Viceroy, the man who ruled India, took a different view. The king in Buckingham Palace said there would be no drinks during the war and austerity was sort of clamped down on the, the British, as far as we could gather from the newspapers, from the minute uh, the, the war began. Here in India, uh, we were being encouraged to go on just the same as before. And we had this vice regal wedding, and we had this scene of a great pomp and splendor. It was meant to impress the Indians with the fact that we weren't frightened, which was a matter of deliberate policy. But it did shock me. It was a scene of great luxury, as the vice regal occasions always were. India, one fifth of humanity, the biggest possession ever held by any empire itself shaped much of imperial policy. The government of India was every bit as majestic, on occasions nearly as powerful, as the government in Britain. India was the second pillar of the empire. At the wedding, the talk was about the European war. The old white dominions chose to join the Allies. Linlithgow announced India was at war without consulting one of her 400 million people. Unasked, India was at war with Germany. Uh, Linlithgow must be admired, I think, for his, his courage to be sticking to his guns and saying that he would continue just as though nothing had happened. You see, a stiff upper lip, the policy of a stiff upper lip. And it was magnificent, perhaps, as in the old phrase, magnificent but not war. As the young couple left the imperial palace, modestly called Viceroy's house, though bigger than Versailles, the honeymoon between Britain and India's elite had long been over. Imperial Britain had promised a free and united India. By 1939, India was already halfway along the road to independence, supervised by only a thin line, the Indian Civil Service, down to just 600 Britons. Indian ministers ran the 11 provinces of British India, nearly two-thirds of the country. The war in Europe changed imperial priorities. Britain now had only one purpose, her own defense and that of her empire. But for Indians, the war posed a cruel dilemma. Wedged between Nazism and imperialism, they felt that the path to independence was blocked on either side. Some of them would not have minded Hitler winning. Most of them would not have liked it. But they didn't see why they should be the fall guys who were to support one imperialism against another. And so the purely nationalist feeling, a plague on both your houses, was the ascendant, I thought. People were not pro or anti-Hitler, they were against, they were for freedom. Since the 1920s, the symbol of Indian freedom had been the puckish figure of Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, the Pied Piper of the four million strong Congress party. The Mahatma, the great soul, though trained as a barrister in London, was Indian in everything else. Congress, India's largest independence movement, had, till Gandhi joined, been a westernized middle-class party. Gandhi changed all that. Congress became a mass party. Swaraj, self-rule, became his slogan. Civil disobedience, his weapon. Gandhi spent as much time at prayer as he did at politics. In a few years, he turned Congress back to the ancient culture of India's 300 million Hindus. He opposed modern technology. The spinning wheel was his symbol. Gandhi's vision of a free India was rural, conservative, and in essence, religious. I want to predict that story with what I want to see. 
that if you really want to see India at its base, you have to find it in a cottage, in a humble home. But behind the scenes, Gandhi was backed by India's richest man. While he fought for the downtrodden, he defended India's caste system. He recruited soldiers in the First World War, then turned pacifist. Millions hailed him as a saint. Most British called him a troublemaker. Some thought he was mad. Wiser officials welcomed Gandhi's pacifism. They saw it as a break on Congress hotheads. The empire preferred non-violence to revolution. Gandhi's main precept was, hate imperialism, but not the imperialists. They're nice people. So don't kill them, don't hate them. Have a regard for them, but tell, you, tell them you're doing something wrong. And I'm going to stop you doing it. It's the action that is wrong, not the people. In November 1939, the same month as the wedding, Congress forced their ministers in the provinces to resign. They demanded that Britain concede immediate independence. The British were secretly pleased. Without interfering congressmen, they could run the war in their own way. But Gandhi's view of the war was a mystery. His blend of Hindu mysticism and practical politics was a purely Gandhian cocktail. It was unique. He lived on these two dimensions at once. The moment um, he started to get a little bit uh, as it were, bewildered or mixed up in politics, he retreated at once into mysticism, you see. And that was his inevitable get-out. Now, this isn't to say that I didn't deeply admire him. I think he was probably one of the real, really significant figures of the 20th century. But at the same time, he'd got this tremendously unique get-out. He, <laughs> he lived in two worlds at the same time, and he could nip from one to the other the drop of a hat if he'd ever had a hat. His followers, like Nehru, did have hats, Gandhi caps. By 1939, Nehru was number two to Gandhi. Women act as stewards at a political meeting on Bombay's Maidan, and the speaker is the pundit Jawaharlal Nehru, product of Harrow and Cambridge. Nehru differed sharply from Gandhi. Non-religious, Western and progressive, he was for the Allies. But Gandhi still dominated Congress. Nehru could only make speeches against the dictators. Some Indians wondered where Nehru's sympathy did lie. My brother, of course, all his views were tinged with his background, his knowledge of the English, his uh, desire uh, uh, to certainly participate in the ending of imperialism, but not to create any sort of, uh, of uh, bitterness or situation which would damage friendship ultimately and so on. Was there a feeling that perhaps Nehru, for some of them, had too much of the West in him? Oh, with all of them. They all thought that. I think every one of them, at some time or the other, thought that, that Nehru had uh, more than was necessary of uh, the West in him. When the war came, there was no doubt about Nehru or his family's sympathy. My father saw fascism and Nazism not merely as they were affecting the Jews or the leftists or somebody in Europe, but as the sh that the shadow would fall on the world as a whole. So he, he saw our problems in that larger setting always, whether it were economic problems or the political problems. In this, he differed because most of the other Indian leadership tended to see just the Indian side of it, and they were not too much concerned about what was happening abroad. Some saw the war as their chance to seize power. Nehru would hear none of it, nor would his colleague, Maulana Azad. Azad and Nehru led the anti-fascists. They wanted a deal with Britain help in the war for independence when it was over. They tried to persuade Congress, but Gandhi, the pacifist, said no. They were talking about violence and non-violence and the ethics of war and all the rest. And Gandhi was sitting on the ground 
and um, Azad, who had some trouble with his knees, he always used to sit on his chair. So he was sitting and putting his hand on Gandhi's head, he said, "Is fikru mein baitha hu, aakhir mujhe kya karna? Is dil se juda hona ya dil bar se juda hona?" He said, "I am sitting confused. What am I to do? Should I leave my beloved, or should I leave the calling of my heart? That the inside, the feeling is to, to go to war and." not to bother about violence and non-violence, but if I do decide anything contrary to non-violence, then I lose my beloved. That was uh, Gandhi. While Congress argued, the British priority was clear. Over a million Indians had fought in the First World War. Now, whether Gandhi approved or not, that effort was doubled. India expanded her army from less than 200,000 to over two and a half million. This is the largest volunteer army in the world. It could be larger still, so far as the men are concerned. There's been no shortage of volunteers, but only of equipment and instructors to train them. In London, Winston Churchill became Prime Minister. A passionate imperialist, for years he had fought to keep India under British rule. For Churchill, India's job was to help win the war. Gandhi he despised. He would make no deal with Congress, that Hindu priesthood he called them. Churchill's only concern was for men and supplies from India. The Oriental barracks in an eastern sea. Despite Gandhi, Congress followed Nehru. They offered Britain a deal. When Churchill turned them down, Congress went off in a huff. for the war. Part of his plan was to use the princely states whose survival depended on the British. The princes had given up effective power. In return, Britain allowed them to run nearly a third of India. A few were modern and progressive. Some were little more than local dictators. The British could count on them to parade and give cash and men. Like medieval barons, they lauded it over some of the most backward areas in the country. Some ruled little more than a village. The princely state of Hyderabad was as big as Spain. princes were afraid of Congress, and most of them banded from their states. They hoped the British would stay in India to protect them. The British found them admirably loyal. The Indian princes were making a positive contribution to the war, and there were other people 
uh, besides the, the Congress who could speak for India. The Congress was a very important party, but uh, they made the great mistake of insisting that they spoke for the whole of India. Not only the princes rejected Congress, the Muslims felt the same, and there were 90 million of them. They had not taken to Western education as readily as the Hindus. They were afraid the 300 million Hindus would beat them at the game of competitive examinations and ballot boxes. With Britain at war, the Muslims were now vital to Churchill's plans. Muslims were nearly a third of the army, and to most British officials, easy to get on with. Many people did have this feeling with, um, uh, with Muslims. I think probably more people felt more at home with Muslims. It was easier, of course, um, because they, you could eat with Muslims. I mean, they would ask one out for a meal, and you could go and eat with them. And it was only, of course, uh, with a Hindu who'd been to England, uh, or who'd become a, a barrister or something of that kind, that you could really sit down and eat in the same way. I, I, mean, I had Hindu friends in one, one village I remember very vividly, um, where uh, they always used to ask me to a meal. But they stood around and watched, and they didn't eat with you. The rulers of India before the British came were Muslim. They dreamed of past glories and of the day when the British would go and they could revive a Muslim empire. All over India, Hindus worshipped the sacred cow. The Muslims killed and ate them. In the towns and villages, people drank Muslim water and Hindu water. We were so far apart that although we lived next door to each other, uh, we uh, didn't intermarry, we didn't eat together, we were not called to each other's ceremonies. Our heroes, the heroes of one were, so to speak, the villains of the other. And, and so, you know, we became quite distinct. We were socially distinct. Although it took, took, took a long time, it was an am ambiguous situation because for 700 years the Muslims ruled. And so a Muslim in India did not really quite know whether he's basically a Muslim or an Indian. To face this problem, Muslims had set up a political party of their own, the Muslim League. They asked for and got protection, separate voting rights from Hindus. This was bitterly opposed by Congress. Mohammed Ali Jinnah was a most unusual Muslim, thoroughly westernized. As a young man, he backed a united India under Congress. He supported Hindu-Muslim marriages. But Jinnah felt Gandhi was turning Congress into a Hindu party. He had hoped to achieve high office in the movement, but Gandhi outshone him. When his effort to build a bridge between Congress and the League was rejected, he quit Indian politics. Jinnah left Congress and India and settled in England, far removed from Gandhi and his peasant loincloth. In 1936, the Muslim League invited him back to be their leader. Jinnah, still nursing deep resentment of Congress, came home to claim his place in India. The man had gone through a lot of ups and downs in life. A man who gets married and within two days of marriage, before marriage is consummated, he goes to England and he hears that his wife had died of fever. Then what happened? He hears that his father has gone bankrupt. He's an honest man, he's a stick, upright fellow, he wants to pay every penny of his father's debtors. Came and took a job as a presidency magistrate, didn't suit him walked down the corridors of Bombay High Court till he became a leading lawyer. And he paid every single penny of his father's debts. 
Then he fell in love with a girl, got married to her. They were estranged after two years. Uh, and when they made up in Paris, within two days, he died in his arms. Then he comes back. He sees how Muslims have been uh, treated by his old friends, the Congress Hindus. He was completely shaken man. He was a disappointed man, completely disappointed. Here was a man who put on a mask, this thin, elegant dandy, who rose to his feet and began to speak very quietly so that everybody listened to him. And everybody sort of leaned forward, you know, listening hard as they could to hear him. But he would hardly raise his voice at all. Um, uh, great arrogance, really, but it was an effective arrogance. And um, in slow, incisive terms, he would put his point across. But I was talking to him once, and there he was talking about um, high politics and so on. And then, quite abruptly, he stopped talking and literally went really quite pale and said, you'll have to excuse me for a moment. And I truly thought he'd been taken ill, because he rose and he left the room, and in five minutes, he came back full of beans, full of bonhomie, and said, you know, that fool of a bearer of mine put the wrong cufflinks in my shirt. And that had totally thrown him. So that was a strange sort of superficiality about the guy, in a way. By the start of the war, Jinnah had become a stern enemy of Congress. He feared the British were going to hand over the Muslims to majority rule under Congress and Gandhi. He saw that as dangerously Hindu. Once he had been called the ambassador of Muslim Hindu unity. Now he proclaimed that the Muslims of India were a separate nation. Why had Jinnah changed? I think I can best answer that by telling you of an occasion when I dined in company with him a friend's house. He said, you British, you're interesting people. As long as it's just a question of administration, you run a country well. When it comes to the business of understanding local movements, local feelings, communal feeling, national feeling, you haven't a clue. He said, you talk about preserving the unity of India. There never is and never has been any unity in India at all except the beneficial unity that you forced on us for the time being. Uh, you're dreaming when you talk about the unity of India. Jinnah wanted power. To get it, he had to unite the Muslims behind the League. Islam in danger was his answer to Gandhi's Hindu appeal. For both sides, religion would bring in the masses. Jinnah revitalized the Muslim League and the British, faced by a hostile Congress, were ready to play along with him. Although the Muslims never gave uh, official support as a Muslim League to the war effort, in practice they, uh, they did help in the war effort. Whereas the Congress, which meant the great body of the Hindu people, didn't. And therefore the British naturally regarded the one as friends and the other as hostile. By 1940, Jinnah and the Muslim League were on the move. In the last provincial election, three years before, they captured only 5% of the Muslim vote. The League needed a touch of Gandhi's magic, a political slogan to inspire the Muslims. Jinnah found it, an idea thrown up by a Muslim student at Cambridge ten years earlier. The name Pakistan contained the first letters of the areas to be included in the new Muslim homeland Jinnah wanted carved out of India. Pakistan would include P for Punjab, a for Afghania, called Northwest Frontier by the British, K for Kashmir, S for Sindh, and Tan from Baluchistan, Pakistan. To this, Jinnah added two other provinces, Bengal and Assam. The League first demanded Pakistan, the partitioning of India, at Lahore in March 1940. The Muslims, the League argued, were not Indians, but a separate nation. They needed their own state to protect them from a Hindu Raj. 
Once Pakistan cry had been raised, there was always the danger that unless some alternative was put forward, everybody would swing towards Pakistan, because it had an enormous appeal to the Muslim masses. In fact, we had foreseen in 1940, when the Pakistan resolution was first put forward, that if it was not stopped early, it would become unstoppable. We should, if possible, have found some alternative to lay before them and let them know very clearly that Pakistan of Jinnah's conception was not on and never would be on. Many British dismissed the Pakistan demand as simply a political gimmick. Some thought it just propaganda by the League or a tactic to boost Jinnah's popularity. It was both. Pakistan was to become Jinnah's rallying cry. Just how powerful he and the Pakistan idea would be, few could then imagine. In early 1942, the war was going badly for Britain, especially in the Far East. After the Japanese air attack on the American fleet at Pearl Harbor, it was Britain's turn. First Malaya, then Singapore were overrun by Japan. When the British commander surrendered Singapore, 80,000 men of the Indian army were lost. In March, the Japanese poured into India's eastern neighbor, Burma, and quickly overran it. Thousands of refugees and British soldiers began the hazardous trek back into India. By now, every British possession east of India had fallen. Panic swept Calcutta and Madras. Thousands fled their homes in fear of invasion. The Americans were alarmed. Roosevelt feared India was the next British domino, ready to fall. He told Churchill that her people must be stiffened by a firm promise of independence. The United States, the first colony to reject the empire, did not want to fight a war to restore British imperialism. At home, the Labour members of the War Cabinet also wanted progress to Indian independence. To Churchill, that meant a surrender to Congress. He thought Indians in government would argue about everything and hold up the war effort. The King honoured the 4th Indian Division when he inspected, in the inner quadrangle of Buckingham Palace, the contingent which is now visiting this country. Colonel Scott, who commands these splendid warriors from India, presents them to their majesties. Talking to them, the king and queen heard again about some of the exploits which won the division glory in Libya and Tunisia. Indian troops drove home the message from the Labour Party and the Americans that a genuine offer to leave India would bring even more men to help the empire to resist a Japanese invasion. Churchill took the opposite view. The obvious policy to be pursued was to stop anyone rocking the boat. India was an important part, not only of the empire, but of the strategic sea. The Japanese were at its gates, the um, Germans hadn't been so far off, and it was extremely important that um, in India should be kept relatively quiet during the war. Roosevelt sent so many envoys to Delhi that the Viceroy was moved to write to Churchill. 
Please arrest, at least for a time, this flow of well-meaning sentimentalists from the USA to India, so that we may mind here what is still, I suppose, our own business. But American delegations continued to proffer advice, while American newsreels mounted a propaganda campaign. For under British rule, the security of India, half as big as the United States and three times as populous, has never been entrusted to the Indian people, but reserved as a function of Great Britain and its viceroys, who one after another have ruled India in the name of the distant King Emperor. American opinion undoubtedly felt that British rule of India was out of date and that they were hanging back on self-government for India. It was a, if you like, a sentimental uh, attitude, but it was a characteristic American attitude. And I think that worked through to the British uh, cabinet and of course to Churchill, for whom Anglo-American relations were supremely important. Churchill resisted the pressure for months and then caved in so suddenly that the Viceroy and his staff had no time to react. I used to handle the cipher in which the Secretary of State and the Viceroy used to carry on their personal correspondence. One morning a telegram began, take strong whiskey pig before continuing. Well, it was very early in the morning, so I, I thought I wouldn't do that, but I knew that some shock was coming. And it was to tell us that uh, the cabinet had decided to send Stafford Cripps out. The scheme which the British government has got out and which I am taking with me to India is one which may uh, successfully settle for all time the future of India as a great uh, free partner in the British Commonwealth of Nations. And once that's solved, I believe we shall be able to rally all the peoples of India to the defense of their own native land, which now is so urgently being threatened. Sir Stafford Cripps brought to India an offer that Churchill had not wanted to make. In return for cooperation in the war, Indians were promised independence when it was over. Cripps, a leading Labour Party member of the cabinet, believed this was what Congress wanted and that it would tempt them into the government at Delhi. Roosevelt and the Labour Party wanted Congress to accept the offer of post-war freedom. But Churchill and his Secretary of State for India, Leo Amory, had other ideas. But I asked uh, Leo Amory, why didn't you go instead of Cripps? He said, well, it was a time, you see, when Cripps was extremely popular in the country, not long come back from being ambassador in Moscow. And some people even thought that he might be able to displace Churchill as prime minister. So he said, well, Churchill and I, we thought that the thing was going to fail anyway. There was no hope in it. It would be better that Cripps failed with it than I did, because that would fix him afterwards. Well, uh, of course, uh, Churchill never expected it to succeed. Churchill, and regarded it as primarily a propaganda exercise. Congress knew that Cripps was a friend, but his Prime Minister Churchill was not. Could Cripps persuade them to do a deal with Britain, or would Churchill scupper his own emissary? The Indian nationalist leadership was in a dilemma. They didn't want to support Hitler, even in a roundabout way. On the other hand, they couldn't support Churchill, who represented British imperialism and giving in to to the empire continuing to the end of the war. So when Cripps arrived, the Indian Congress leadership was divided in its own mind, in its own heart. But Gandhi had no doubt. When he came to meet Cripps, he asked, is this all you've come 7,000 miles to give us? He suggested Cripps take the next flight home. Then the unpredictable Gandhi withdrew. He did not condemn the offer openly. Nehru and Azad hoped for Congress jobs in the government. Gandhi, this time, stood aside. Gandhi thought the Congress leadership would rather negotiate and make a bargain with the British, giving support for the war effort in return for getting independence. He felt that the Indian people as a whole wanted this exchange on nationalist grounds. 
And it would be doing violence to the Indian people if he, on grounds of non-violence or pacifism, were to oppose the war effort in a, on principle. So he said he would remain passive and let the Congress Working Committee and the British free to negotiate what would appeal to the Indian people. Cripps made good progress in his meetings with Nehru and Azad. With his approval, they drew up a list of names for the new Indian government which Cripps hoped to bring into being. The envoy tried to carry the Viceroy with him, but Linlithgow felt Cripps was stepping into his territory. He undoubtedly, in my view, went uh, beyond his brief in discussing matters which were essentially matters for the Viceroy to settle. But if they went beyond into his sphere, he said to me, I think Cripps is uh, baiting the trap with my cheese. Cripps thought he had acted properly. But Linlithgow complained to London. That gave Churchill his opportunity. He bounced the cabinet into forcing Cripps to withdraw the idea of Indian ministers in the government. He came and he spoke that the position in India will be the same as of the Prime Minister in England vis-à-vis -vis -vis the Queen. But later on it went on changing until it came to just supervising some canteens run for the soldiers. So naturally Nehru was very hurt about it. But we found here it was nothing, it was just a big joke what was offered. So that was a disappointment because uh, Cripps was regarded as a friend of India, he was very friendly with Nehru and he had uh, come earlier in 1939 on his own and spoken and talked about uh, the Indian freedom movement and India's struggle and that uh, the British and the Indians have to work together and all that. And to see a man like that go back on his declared uh, policies so quickly, within a few days, and uh, that was a disappointment for many people. Churchill's maneuver worked. Within days, Congress rejected the entire offer. Cripps failure was total. Churchill was delighted and blamed Congress. American pressure died down. The Labour Party were silenced. Nehru was forced onto the defensive. Yet it is said that this attempt has failed. We tried our utmost. Indeed, we went to further lengths than I could have dreamt myself going. Yet there were limits. Beyond, we could, beyond which we could not go, because that would have meant our breaking all the pledges we had given ourselves and to our people, and upsetting everything and every scheme that we had in our mind. When Congress rejected the offer, Jinnah publicly followed suit. We gave our earnest and most careful consideration to the proposals that Sir Stafford Cripps brought to India on behalf of His Majesty's government. But the differences are so vital and fundamental, and the constitutional problem of India is so complex that it was not possible to secure agreement and dissolve the differences and find a satisfactory solution to all concerned. But privately, Jinnah was delighted. British need for Muslim soldiers, vital to the war, had produced a windfall for the Muslim League. Part of the Crips offer was designed to encourage and protect the Muslims. Provinces unwilling to join an independent India could opt out, and the British would help them. The way was open for a Muslim majority province to say it wouldn't have any part uh, of the new constitution, and therefore uh, would was able to form at least a, a fragment of a Pakistan. Uh, and once you had committed yourself to that, and it remained the statement of British policy, although the declaration was never declared, uh, it was only a draft, once it had become British policy, uh, the separatists could fall back on that at least uh, as being part of the, the, the Bible from which they went forward and developed their theology. The offer conceded the right of an Indian province for secession from the center, which meant if one province can get that right, 
four provinces can they get that right? Six provinces can get that right. Half a dozen provinces can get that right. So therefore, indirectly, the British cabinet, you see, conceded the right of the Muslim League, and to that Pakistan. gave to Pakistan, and that gave confidence to the Muslim League leadership. How far, though, at that point, did Mr. Jinnah really want Pakistan in 1942 when Crips came here? Well, I think uh, till then they were not very serious about it, but when this came, when Mr. Cripps came and he offered that, you see, then naturally uh, Muslim League leadership became more confident and uh, started uh, uh, talking from the position of strength, you see. They thought uh, the Congress party wants freedom and the only way to delay freedom is to support another group which will be with, stand by us. And uh, so by supporting the Muslims, Muslim League, uh, they could delay the transfer of power. It was a very good excuse. Without uh, any uh, putting, um, at, at least they could say that in the, to the others in the world. That what are we going to do? It's, we are carrying a heavy burden. Uh, India is, uh, if we leave India, there will be trouble. And all that kind of thing. Churchill had got what he wanted. Cripps' honesty had served his purpose. You must not feel unduly discouraged or disappointed by the result. An exultant Churchill wrote to him. The effect throughout Britain and in the United States has been wholly beneficial. Cripps now knew he had been cynically used by Churchill. Publicly, he had to cover it up and blame Congress. The draft declaration, which I brought to India on behalf of the war cabinet, and which I explained to you last time I spoke over the wireless, has been rejected by your leaders. I am sad that this great opportunity of rallying India for her defense and her freedom has been missed. Those of Gandhi's followers who had opposed the mission felt vindicated. What is the meaning of it? Take everything from us and then afterwards they can say, oh, go home. Who could trust the British? They are known as perfidious beaten. That is what politicians are known about. Well, we didn't believe in that kind of politics. That's what Gandhiji taught us. A post-dated check on the bank, only a foolish man will accept it. Gandhi, it is said, called the offer a post-dated check on a crashing bank. With the Japanese at the borders of India, Gandhi thought a British defeat was a real possibility. India, he believed, might soon have Asian masters. After Crip's failure, Gandhi turned quickly to positive action. Well, I would say that by 9th August 1942, the patience of most of the Majority was exhausted and Gandhi came into his own. That is, Gandhi could control the Congress and lead it to oppose the war effort completely because by that time everyone was fed up with the British inability to come to terms. Congress met in Bombay. Nehru reluctantly proposed the resolution that Gandhi wanted, that the British should quit India. The next day, Gandhi was to outline a program of passive resistance. He never arrived. In the early hours, he was arrested with all the other top leaders, including Nehru. As news of the arrests filtered out, rebellion erupted in India. Despite the newsreel's attempts to play down the uprising, not since the Indian mutiny had British rule been challenged so seriously. The first pictures to arrive in England since the arrest of Gandhi and the Congress Working Committee. Prompt action by the authorities and the removal of the organizers of civil disobedience did much to quiet in India. With the Japanese at the very gates of the country, the Congress party made their demands, hoping to press them at a time of crisis. Shopkeepers were called upon to help by closing their shops. Only quick, decisive action by the government could prevent serious sabotage to the whole war effort. That action was taken. There were demonstrations in many places 
but on duty were Indian troops and police, loyal as ever, and symbolic of the determination of India as a whole. In France, in Libya, and in Burma, Indian troops have given their lives fighting for a cause they know to be just. They represent the spirit of India, not the Congress mob. A mob swayed by the eloquence of their leaders into falsely believing that an India without England would be an India for the India. It was very unplanned. Gandhi did not plan what was to happen after he was locked up. The result was that when he and the national leadership were locked up, the planning of the campaign fell to the hands of my friends who were mostly Congress socialists and militant nationalists. And they took over the running of the campaign underground. Then they planned it, and they planned uh, the uprooting of railway tracks, cutting of telegraph wires, what you might call sabotage of a slightly gentle kind. The main railway supplying the Burma front was destroyed. Military operations against the Japanese were delayed. For nearly two weeks, the governor of Bihar province was cut off in his capital, at Patna. So then we decided that the British government may reinforce their strength in Patna by bringing armed forces. So it was better to isolate the headquarters, Patna, so that they could not bring their forces. And that could be possible only if we destroy train. We learned that we can get dynamite from the coal fields, so he brought dynamite and he said, this is the last train that will run. Two hundred and seventy-nine railway stations and five hundred and fifty post offices were attacked. Thirty trains, many carrying vital war supplies for the Japanese front, were derailed, never to arrive. England knew very little about what happened in August 1942, when the main line railway between Delhi and Calcutta was broken. I think it didn't run for about two weeks when for quite a long time the rule of government didn't run in the province of Bihar, when there were uh, outrages of various sorts all over the country, when in Delhi itself it was as much as a white man's life was worth, unless perhaps he was a priest in his priestly robes, to show himself. In the summer of 1942, the British were stretched to the limit. The victorious Japanese were threatening India. Now India itself was on the edge of insurrection. Just three years ago, at the wedding of the Viceroy's daughter, the fabric of empire appeared unshakable. Now, disaster was just round the corner. Get the hardback book, End of Empire, at the ABC shop in your capital city.